It's The World This Week, seven days, four Paris-based correspondents, one hour. The World This Week in partnership with The Daily Beast. Joining us, and elisabeth Moutet, columnist with The Sunday Telegraph and The Daily Telegraph. How are you? Hi. <laughs> Welcome back. Thank Welcome you. back as well to Paris-based TV producer Ulrika Kolterman. Thanks for having me. How's your week? Guten Abend. Busy. Busy. Has it been busy for Laure Mondeville? I imagine it to your correspondent for the Figaro, <laughs> who's uh, just fresh off the plane back right. from covering the U.S. midterm. Exactly. We'll talk about that in a moment. And uh, joining us as well, journalist and commentator George Kazolius. Good to be back. Thanks for coming in. The World This Week on Facebook and on Twitter. Hashtag World This Week. Election day was Tuesday in the United States, yet the dust still hasn't settled on midterm elections marked by record high turnout in parts and a shifting political landscape. Democrats flipping the House of Representatives, making inroads in suburban areas and also uh, among women. This is the state of play again as they continue to count those ballots. Republicans keeping the Senate thanks to uh, a fired up base of Trump supporters. And here's where it gets interesting. On the night, Donald Trump's margin looks set to grow in the upper chamber by quite a bit, from 51 to maybe 53, 54 seats for the Republicans. Now, Democrats still in with a shot to prove initial exit polls wrong in Arizona and in Florida, where governor and Senate candidate Rick Scott is fuming. We've all seen the incompetence and the irregulators in vote tabulations in Broward and Palm Beach for years. Well, here we go again. I will not sit idly by while unethical liberals try to steal this election from the great people of Florida. <laughs> George Cazoles. Well, I don't understand it. He's in charge of the whole organization of elections in, in Florida, and he's criticizing the process that he put in place. So it's, it's really, really strange. But I'm quite happy this is happening. Uh, it shows that in some uh, ways this system does work, you know. you that uh, you can't cheat everywhere like they tried to do in Georgia, like they tried to do in North Carolina, where voter suppression, uh, where there's gerrymandering. There, at there's, least. there's a discussion just about how much voter suppression matters, particularly in an election where the turnout's been so high. Well, it's funny that we say there's high turnout. By European standards, 49% is not high, you know. And, and given what's happened over the past two years, that only 49% of the voters turned out to vote is kind of shocking for me, even in the United States. Lormandville? Well, I think the, the turnout, I mean, uh, is, is high for midterm elections, and uh, you cannot deny that. So uh, I, I, I'm not surprised, you know, that these, these things arise. And I, it's, uh, we've had such a contentious fight, and uh, the result is actually contentious in the sense that it's, it's a mixed result. And so everyone is, is going to try to, uh, to uh, read what is going on as, as a victory. And it's in a way, it's not, not a only that, for the, both. The legal battles have begun in Arizona yes, and exactly. in Florida. It, it's like we're reliving the 2000 presidential election, which dragged on for months. Exactly. So this is actually uh, quite interesting to see how it's going to play out, because uh, uh, who will decide in the end? You know, there's going to be recount. Of, of the votes and uh, or replay, you know, like in Georgia, for instance, where uh, um, the uh, you know the Democrats are Stacey are, Abrams. Uh, yes, yeah, Stacey Abrams wants you know a, a, a rerun of the election. So I think this is going to, of course, increase the uh, the confrontation, which is I mean, which I have found extremely strong, you know, in the country. I mean, this is a very divided country. When, when you watch this. What, what amazes me is still the, the, the broader picture of the Senate, how little representative it is. I mean, there are states like Wyoming with, uh, what, 600,000 people having the same representation as California with 40 million. So that just can't go on forever. There needs to be a change of a system at one point. And yet it can go on forever, Annie, because Americans have this constitution written in the 18th century which is uh, a bit like uh, the, uh, the, uh, the the Talmud or the Bible from high above yeah we're not you you can discuss it and amend it but you can't change it um, I 
at the end of the day, you've got the Senate, where the Senate, it doesn't matter, you've got two two senators per state, and then it's more or less proportional in terms of representation, although you, there are the auditors that you, you've described. Um, but I don't think, I can't think of any country where each constituency has exactly the same number of voters for the same representation. Uh, we've got big disparities like that in England, we've got them in France. I, I don't think it's so, it's so shocking. What's interesting is that, yes, first of all, uh, uh, you know, the vote work, the bringing people to vote actually did work. I think 49% is actually in, in midterm very important. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing is um, what we see is part of the, the, the split is the split that should have happened immediately after Hillary Clinton's defeat, which was the atomization of the, of the Democratic Party and the sharp divide between the, the, uh, uh, the old sort of more quote-unquote reasonable uh, like Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi, and the young Turks like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the 29-year-old uh, socialist who won a, uh, a seat in, in, in New York. And these are people who want contention all the time. They want to start impeachment procedures against uh, Trump. They want a number of uh, uh, um, strong measures and complete uh, uh, belligerence against Trump. And, and Pelosi has been asking for uh, a bipartisan collaboration, which is really interesting. So I think what we're going to see before anything else is the split between the two, you know, the old and the new among the Democrats. And, and we have no idea which kind of candidate the Democrats are going to field up in the end in the 2020 presidential race against Donald Trump. Absolutely. I think, to, I mean, to follow up uh, with what has been said is that the, uh, the Democrats have... No program, in fact. They don't agree on what they should do. No strategy as such for now. They don't have any uh, real candidate. You know, they have a, a, you know, a flurry of old uh, uh, people from the old, uh, you know, guard. I would say Hillary Clinton still talking about her, which is absolutely incredible, according to me. Uh, you know, Joe Biden, there's Elizabeth Warren, who is now, you know, sort of... A, uh, not so popular at all because she she's seen as a, as a radical. You have a uh, some some people who have arrived in this race, you know, from uh, minorities and so so I, I, for now there is nobody nobody and uh, so that's why Trump, in fact, because of the the result we're seeing in the Senate, is actually quite well placed because you you have to remember that actually the elect electoral college in the presidential election is very much uh, comparable to what is happening in, in the election in the Senate. The, this, this is a sort of a, a more precise picture of, of what could so play out. What's not helping things is that normally these midterm elections should have been an occasion to sh show these new faces that are, are in the, the most promising and bright new face lost on the night. It was, uh, Are you talking about Beto? I'm talking about Beto, Beto O'Rourke, O'Rourke yeah, who was, well, running, against, no, who was he running against Ted he Cruz didn't in Texas. Lose. He was 900,000 votes behind before he started. He got 800,000 more votes than the last Democrat. He lost by 100,000. He didn't lose. He showed, he showed that there is room in the United States, even in Texas, for a left-wing movement in the United States. And that's what I'm hoping for in the future. I agree with Ann Elizabeth about this atomization. I'm hoping the Democrats split. We need a new party in this. A case. third party. Well, look, we got a conservative party called the Democratic Party. We've got an extreme right party called the Republican Party in the United States. We need a party on the left. And the dynamics of these new young Turks, as uh, Anna, uh, Anna Elizabeth referred to them as, shows there is room for something on the left. Now, that's why I say it's going to get worse before it gets better, because obviously, if there's a split in the Democrats, the Republicans win in 2020. But, but we need this. We need what, something and why do you call the left? Because this is the whole question, you know, because actually the debate is whether we're going to have a, a, an identity-based approach to a to the future on the on the Democratic Party, which was actually, I think, one of the main reasons why Hillary Clinton failed in her campaign, because actually she addressed to, a, you know, all these different minorities that was piling up to get enough votes, like Obama, and this coalition didn't work. Or Hillary are they Clinton going? Lost. Are they going to go back to Hillary some kind Clinton of lost more because she was social. too close to Wall Street? Because Trump pointed out she was bought off by Wall Street, and Trump said, "I can't be bought off. I'm rich already." That's why she lost. But no, but the, she lost. She also. She, I mean, she lost. You know, the the mid the Midwest, and she lost. You know, the the uh, uh, the popular popular vote, uh, the, the middle class, and and uh, and uh, you know, sort of low middle class in America, which which used to be you know the the base of the Democratic Party, 
And, and I don't think they're going back. You know, I, I was traveling throughout Pennsylvania and they are sticking to Trump. I they think that's the yeah. future in the yeah. Un, yeah. Un, unless you have a return like to Sanders approach and sort of left populism on the left. Yeah. I think there is a big risk now that uh, the Democrats in the House of Representatives now, they will chair a lot of committees so they can set the agenda. They can start a lot of investigations. But if they start lots of investigations that are not of public interest, it's a danger that um, they will not show that they are able to govern. And, and this is the biggest risk that they might want to take revenge now. Revenge right. on might want to take revenge. And that was certainly on the minds yes. of Donald Trump the day after the election. Trump firing his attorney general, Jeff Sessions. Sessions, who is uh, never forgiven, it seems, for recusing himself in the Russia meddling investigation. It could well be a new chapter in the probe now, as protesters in New York and several cities Thursday evening uh, were rallying against the appointment of Matthew Whitaker. He's the new uh, acting head of the Justice Department. Whitaker, a former federal prosecutor, who in the past has called for the pulling of the plug on the Mueller investigation, Elizabeth Moutet. I still, I mean, I personally think the Mueller investigation is going to be one of those uh, uh, sort of chewing gum uh, issues that will sort of, you know, stretch all the way to, to appear whenever needed, but uh, it, with, with no significance whatsoever. But I'm in a minority on this one. What's interesting is that it showcases uh, the annoyance of Trump, but it doesn't necessarily Do you mean... think he'll pull the plug on the investigation? Uh, actually, I think that's very awkward. I mean, this is a lawyer we're talking about. This is a prosecutor we're talking about. Uh, I, I, it might be more difficult. I don't have inside knowledge. I don't know him. I haven't followed him, and therefore... I mean, he said it oh, He said it clearly. He was on CNN saying that he was criticizing. He, this is he used the words about. witch hunt. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, but he, yes, but that doesn't mean he's going to... Sorry, he's not going to pull the plug. It also means that he might say, well, you know, redo it but in accordance to all procedure, due procedure. Well, well, let's listen to what Donald Trump had to say, and this picks up on your point. Yes. The threat of subpoenas by the new Democratic majority in the House, a question put to the president at uh, a post-midterms press conference on Wednesday. So we can uh, look at us, they can look at us, and then we can look at them, and it'll go back and forth, and it'll probably be very good for me politically. I could see it being extremely good politically, because I think I'm better at that game than they are, actually. George Kazolius. It's actually true. Well, yeah, it's very, uh, you, you think Trump's playing games all the time. He just loves No, but this. if the Democrats go at him with subpoenas... They, that stuff. would be a big mistake. The Democrats have to somehow draw up a program. They have to show they have a program. What is their position on immigration, for example? You know, they, they, they completely avoided that question, which was one of the main questions voters were asking themselves. So it would be a big mistake. What they have to do in the next two years is show that they have a program, that, that show they have issues they want to raise and laws that they would like to get voted through. And if they spend all their time attacking Trump, they're just playing his game the same way they've been doing it the past two years. And there was polls that were saying that um, the biggest priority for people who identify themselves as Democrats is health care. The second one was impeachment, which would be really risky. But uh, it still says the first first priority is health care. And so there. There are grounds where they can work on and where they can actually find um, a deal with the Republicans. They, they, they can find a deal, but the number one issue, L'Ormandville, that Trump campaigned on, even though the economy's been booming, right? Yes. He didn't campaign on the economy. He campaigned on identity issues. and On and, immigration. Actually. And stigmatizing uh, migrants trying to come into the country. Posing. Yes, exactly. I think the uh, immigration issue is, is, is huge, actually, among the voters. So on the Democratic side... A lot of people want to impeach Trump, and he's going to use it if they go this way because they've been obsessed with Trump, and they have t spent their time trying to take him down with the collusion, with the you know accusations that he was too weak, that he was a Manchurian candidate of of Putin, that he was a stupid guy, that he was. I mean, everything went, and and he's still actually holding on pretty well. I mean, if you look at it, and I think immigration actually is an interesting case because. The immigration issue, indeed, the, the, the Democrats have been actually, you know, proposing, in, in, in fact, you know, uh, the um, sort of humanitarian approach. And, and the Trump electorate, when you talk to them, 
they, they stick to Trump. Why? Despite the fact that he's so outrageous in the way he expresses himself sometimes, you know, sort of building up on the ideas of Middle Easterners and things like that. They don't look at that. They look at the fact that he says, we have borders, we have laws, let's respect the borders and the laws and the legal way to come in. So actually, he t he's telling... He's telling the story that I'm not against immigration, I'm against illegal immigration. And the people like that. And actually, when you look at the, at the, poll, at, at the polls, you have a more important percentage of people who support Trump's on immigration than they support the Democrats. I was looking at a, just before the election, after he had said all these outrageous statements, he had 48 percent of support and they had 44 so it's, I mean, it's not like, you know, a majority of Americans don't want borders and don't want control. So I think he's playing on an issue. If they don't, don't go some kind of more, you know, in a way responsible and legal approach, he could actually continue to thrive on that. Of course, you, you, you're right to say that he's losing maybe some voters in the suburbs. But I'm wondering whether it's more, more Democrats coming from the suburbs rather than Republican women coming. I'm not sure about that, actually. I didn't meet any Republican women who were shifting to, to, uh, to the Democrats. I think they, they, maybe they didn't go out to vote. but I, I'm, Which is also signifying. Which is, of course, it's signifying. That means they don't like his rhetoric. They're embarrassed, and they say that. They say, we would like him to shut his big mouth sometimes. <laughs> but on, uh, they, they also say, uh, you cannot have a melting pot in the U.S., if you don't have laws. We are a country of laws, and the, the diversity of our country cannot hold if we don't respect the law. Actually, they say we want to go back to what was known as the melting pot, and now what you have are separate tiny little communities that are at war with one another, or that are described by the aggressive left, which is surfacing exactly. in the Democratic Party. Or and by that, the President of the United States. Oh, <laughs> by the, well, right. it's not lived that way. I mean, the idea that, you know, if you're the, the whole you know, white tears thing, that goes all the way to the New York Times. There has been a poll about two, three weeks ago in America, which showed that political correctness is detested by a majority of Americans, Democrats and Republicans in the country, something like 75%. And when even we, when we come back, blacks when, and Hispanics. When we come back, we're going to turn our focus to uh, uh, Trump's next stop. It's here, Paris, for the commemorations of the 100th anniversary of uh, the end of World War One. Stay with us. It's The World This Week. Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's The World This Week, The World This Week in partnership with The Daily Beast. We're in the company of anne Elisabeth Boutet, columnist at The Daily Telegraph and The Sunday Telegraph. Also with us, Paris-based TV producer Ulrika Kolterman, uh, Laure Monville, senior correspondent at Le Figaro and the author of Who is Donald Trump? <laughs> and uh, a journalist and commentator, George Kazolius. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Yeah, this Sunday in Paris, commemorations to mark the 100th anniversary, to end the war, to end all wars, a term dear to Woodrow Wilson. 60 world leaders, including the current occupant of the White House, uh, will be taking part. But Donald Trump uh, won't be taking part, and he's a bit muté, in a peace summit that's being organized by France's president. Yes, apparently Trump uh, comes in, he goes to a ceremony at uh, Retour, where the uh, armistice was signed, and then there's a lunch at the Élysée with all those heads of state. And how different would you say Trump and Woodrow Wilson are? Well, Woodrow Wilson was actually much more unpopular than he is in France to this day in America when he finally decided to get into the war and it took him time. Um, so that's not exactly the But, you the know, the, the man who, who talked about multilateralism, fa helped found the League of Nations. Um, well, yes. Not, no. <laughs> it's a different year. It's so difficult to actually, I mean, you know, how different are Clemenceau and Emmanuel Macron for that matter? No, he, got, I mean, he got none of the uh, <clears throat> points in the Versailles Treaty that he wanted to. Unfortunately, he fell ill and had to go back to the States. But none of the things like... The end of secret diplomacy, for example. He, all these things that Wilson wanted, all the points he wanted, he didn't get one through. But yeah. and actually, Apparently, uh, even the organizers of the Peace Forum are happy that he's not attending because the Peace Trump. Forum, Trump, is about multilateralism, and that's just <laughs> and, not his case. But I think that, you know, he's really, in a sense, the opposite of Wilson because Wilson believed in a 
in a, in a world where peace would emerge, and he was actually <clears throat> pretty naive in his approach to, uh, to the international affairs and the world. And uh, Trump is actually a, a Machiavellian guy or Aubergine type of, of uh, president. He thinks that, you know, uh, st strength matters more than multilateralism. And his world is a world of rapport de force, you know, power relations. And so in, in, he's absolutely different from, uh, from uh, Wilson and from Macron. Macron is actually during the United Nations session, as you know, in September, draw this sort of... Uh, huge apology of, of multilateralism, and Trump believes more in cooperation between uh, nation states, and he puts the emphasis in the importance of, of, of state and, and the strength of the state, of the nation. Just a detail that shows uh, his approach is that when he announced that he was coming to France, he said he was coming to the parade, not even knowing that there was no parade, because there is no victory to be celebrated. It's a commemoration, and there can't be a parade, a military parade, when Angela Mer Merkel is attending as well. Angela Merkel, Vladimir Putin, the uh, the Russians who fought in World War One, but uh, who... Recep Erdogan, who was on the German side. Oh, yeah. It, it's, uh, your, your thoughts on the, the, the 60 leaders that are showing up? I think it's very important that Angela Merkel is there, <laughs> because she will go to that, um, to, to Compiègne. It's, it's so full of symbolism. It's the same place where they signed the armistice in 1918, 1940, and now they go again and show their reconciliation, and she will deliver a speech, the opening speech, actually, at the forum, peace forum, and she will be there at the ceremony, so I think it's really important. He has a message to tell Macron. He says nationalism kills, and that's what he was yeah, saying uh, all week long when he was traveling east, uh, yeah, eastern you, France, which but, is very unusual. Right, he left Paris for six but, days. Yeah, so. but they're burying the whole stupid reason that it was World War I, you know, imperial colonial profit interest. That war was criminal from the get-go. It was unnecessary. It was avoidable. And what we should do every 11th of November is take effigies of the, all those generals and burn them in a public square. That's right. exactly oh, wow. what we bring should us, do. You bring us to the next point <laughs> because the, cer this, the ceremony, part, there'll be a previous ceremony on Saturday at the Invalide, which is the <laughs> National Armory. And now, all week long, from Strasbourg Cathedral and the company of his German counterpart to the battlefields of the Somme in northern France this Friday, in the company of UK Prime Minister Theresa May. It's been a week, as George was saying, of remembrance visits for Emmanuel Macron. The French president, though, uh, justifying the fact that, yes, they're going to be honoring these seven field marshals on Saturday. One of those field marshals uh, is, uh, uh, well, Philippe Pétain, the hero of the Battle of Verdun in World War I, who would later go on to lead the Nazi collaborator Vichy regime during World War II. I'm not taking any shortcuts, but I'm also not concealing any part of history. And Marshal Pétain was also a great soldier during World War I. That's the reality of our country. It's also what makes political life, as well as human nature, often more complex than what we would want to believe. One can be a great soldier during World War I and then make fatal choices in the Second World War. My role is not to comprehend how this shocks people or to comment on their reactions. My role is to try to explain and be firm in my convictions. I've always faced our history head on. Is he right? Is this a storm in a teacup that there is the Pétain of World War I and the Pétain of World War II, and they're different people? He's not a professor of history uh, at you know, a university debating with uh, experts. He is a politician, he's the French president, and his role is not to give us potted histories in 20 seconds answering a, lead, a, lead, uh, a leading question from a journalist. I mean, the journalist was quite right to ask questions. But this is, you know, this is known as an own goal in sports, uh, in sports talk is, you, you know, there are problems that you can get politically and, you know, they fall on you, you've got to deal with them. That is one that he created entirely by himself, uh, singling out, you know, uh, uh, answering and singling out for Pétain, trying to make this incredible uh, difference. Uh, you know, is one man, uh, the, the, uh, should one look at the entire life of a man and uh, or, or should one should one sort of take things in, in piecemeal? There is no good answer to this. Um, it's Pétain is a symbol. If you ask people in the street whether Pétain is more important because of World War One or World War Two, most people who know who he is will say World War Two because he was the symbol of defeat and collaboration. There were nothing but you know uh, um, uh, basically some, he had everything to lose and nothing to win, and he. I 
Yeah. I think he, into this. he has a point, but it was just another communication problem. He, there were so many communication problems, and it, it's a shame because he was on this long trip and uh, talking about very important issues, and then he should have known that by mentioning Pita and trying to explain it briefly in a couple of sentences, it would lead to a communication disaster, and they actually had to backpedal because the, the ceremony was planned for... Uh, several marshals, including Pétain, and then they changed the numbers and then said, yeah, maybe only five or six, or maybe just those who are invalid. Um, so th th they had to adjust after this communication error. So, yeah, it was a mistake. But there's this complete mania in France, this known as in French as mémoriel. You've got, you, suddenly history is used to score points and, and sort of give well, lessons from everywhere? in politics. It's, it's everywhere Not in like the same that. way. If you look at the way, uh, uh, God knows, the, 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 you know, the World War I is something that, that are uh, mowed down at entire generations of young Britons. And the way the British do this is quite dignified, old-fashioned, the Queen goes, everybody's in black. You don't have sort of the president followed by, by, by a crew of journalists with his spin doctor next to him, Lord answering Monville. question to, uh, as if he were doing a sort of mini grand oral de l'ENA. This L is ridiculous. Laurent Monville, do you take George's point, though, that uh, the ceremony on Saturday at the Invalides, honoring these generals, some of whom were quite incompetent Butchers. and sent a Butchers. lot of people like lambs to the slaughter, <coughs> is a bit out of place, that it would have been better to have just a ceremony that celebrates memorially all the all the dead the way Anne Elizabeth was described I don't know I mean personally I think that that, that you know everyone is is uh, uh, as some it's very complicated when you say you know you, you have to burn the effigies of these generals oh I mean, yes you can say no that these gen many of these generals actually uh, send a lot of people to to death that's for sure you know maybe maybe not 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 uh, 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 gratuously, right? But at the same gratuously. time, gratuously, yeah, oh, of course. Yeah. It was. I mean, you can, you can, but you can't. But at the same time, excuse me, excuse me. I'm the sorry. British, the French, <laughs> the British, the French, and American generals sent their troops on the offensive for six hours after right. the armistice was fired, but, uh, was signed. Henry Gunther, Sergeant Henry Gunther, was killed at 10:59. Right. seconds before the uh, armistice went into effect because Pershing wanted to show what a great guy he was sending the guys in into machine guns with bayonets. They were butchers. Yeah. They counted their victories and how many men they could afford to lose in relationship to their adversary. But at the same time, I don't think you can judge what was happening on the battlefield at that time by the, 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 uh, the um, you know, your own now uh, sensitivities. Yes, yeah, sensitivities of the time of the 21st century. Why? And, because and, you just do it again. If you don't, and, a memorial and, is understanding what happened, why it happened, how it happened. Otherwise, yes. you just let the same people do it again. Yes, you but when you do, of, but when you do, hook. when you do celebrate the hundredth anniversary, I mean, you cannot deny You're that some of these celebrating the generals. People, yeah, some of the generals became, uh, you know, the symbol of, for instance, Verdun. Uh, Joffre, uh, uh, even You've Pentin. visited Verdun. P Pétain. You've seen Pétain. the bones. You've seen the graves. Right. How can you celebrate a general who's responsible for no, that? No, you celebrate the, the blood that was versed for, for the country. No, you're celebrating the generals and so for the country. So let the Germans take no. Paris? But was I it, was I, it cele no, they're all guilty. All those aristocrats, all those industrialists, all those generals, wherever they are. I want to burn each and every effigy of, of all the nationalities. I don't make a distinction. Nevertheless. As I don't make a distinction between any of the soldiers on any of the sides yes. who were sent to the slaughter. Yes, but nevertheless, they were, they were not only, they were sent to the slaughter, but they also did it out of patriotism. They were so lied if you to. So if you dismiss it, if you dismiss but that, December you cannot 1940, understand, Christmas sorry, 1914. You cannot, no, actually, you cannot Christmas understand. Christmas 1914, so fraternization. You, what I'm telling you is that you cannot understand what happened during the First World War and what happened afterwards, actually in the Second World War, if you don't understand the huge sac patriotic sacrifice that was made during that time. Nationalism and, or patriotism? And Yes, exactly. And the Which? people, the people, the patriotism it cannot be dismissed. And actually, you know, even for Pétain, the polemic, we were t the controversy we were talking about, if you, don't, if, if you don't understand that Pétain was so beloved after the First World War, he was, a, he was a, indeed a hero. And, and he was perceived as such, the, the French people would never have accepted the way he actually decided in 1940 
uh, wrongly not true. on not certain. True. They, not true. Yes, France they has just fi- believed. Not they true. Believed France them. has finally admitted it wasn't Pétain. It was France that deported Jews. It was France that killed communists no, uh, under I'm, the German occupation. It's not true. Uh, going after Pétain this way is another attempt by the French to hide their responsibility. No, that's in World another War II. story. It, no, right, it's an- not. Another story. No, another story, be. indeed. The word of the week on this continent doesn't come from the English language. Introducing the center-right's Spitzenkandidat (laughs) for next spring's European elections. And if all goes to plan, the next president of the European Commission. Thankfully, Ulrike Kulterman is here to tell us what Spitzenkandidat means and who this man is. Great, great pronunciation. Congratulations. <laughs> well, we don't know if he will actually be the next Juncker because... Uh, what is a Spitzenkandidat? Spitzenkandidat, he's uh, number one. The top of the Just, slit. The, he's a top. So right. okay. he's Merkel's man, basically. And he's a little bit like Merkel. He's not too charismatic. Um, he's a Bavarian, man for He's Bavarian, Bavarian, yeah. Bavarians are very much uh, <laughs> 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 successful these days. Um, yeah, he, he's a top candidate now. But uh, it's not sure at all if his party wins that he will be the next president of the commission because like, Macron is not in favor at all um, that this will continue like this. There's this 2013 agreement, but uh, he already said that... It would, uh, be, it would be the first time in recent memory that you have a German at the head of the European Commission. There was one, but... Um, long time ago. Lo- very long time ago. Mm-hmm. And I mean, the Germans have a lot of top positions, but not number one. So why not? Why not? Do you agree? Why not, Anna Elisabeth Mutter? I think uh, cosmetically, if nothing else, because I respect German democracy, I think it's quite remarkable. But ha- after all the anti-European feeling that has swept through Europe, having a German as president of the EU of the European Commission uh, right now probably would strike the wrong note. Not much of a choice because the Germans aren't going to let somebody in there who might favor greater federalism and integration, and, and the Germans know they're the ones who will have to pay the bill. And he also, he, there's also a big, uh, another big problem. I mean, uh, Urban's party is in their conservative group as well. And during the pre-campaign in Bavaria, the CSU received Urban and had a... Let, let's talk about that. One, uh, Urban, who showed up, by, it was in Helsinki that they held their, their big, uh, the, the, the EPP is the name of the voting bloc in the European Parliament. They held their big conference there. And the Hungarian prime minister was front and center. Uh, he made his own speech before his political family. He's in the same political grouping in, in the parliament, uh, putting the accent, you might say, on the Christian part of Christian Democrat. Despite his illiberal views, Viktor Orban remains a member of that voting bloc. Let's hear on that score from the Spitzenkandidat. I think there are other examples as well, not only Hungary, which we have concerns at the moment on the table. I want to mention Poland, where we have a lot of concerns, and where Europe showed with the support of EPP that the Commission was active. We put it on the table of the European Court of Justice. So putting it on the table, and in fairness to Manfred Weber, he did vote for a motion sanctioning Viktor Orban, yet... Yes. He's still in the family. He hasn't been kicked out. It's Absolutely. They need him. It's, it's a political... I, I, what I understand... Should he be kicked out? ...of Manfred uh, Weber, that he wants actually to keep the PPE together. And uh, they need the, the Hungarians. They need the Poles. I mean, they're very afraid... But they don't the, stand the for the rebellion. same things anymore. Yeah, I mean, they, as you know, there is a huge debate that has started in Germany uh, over many things which are actually somehow echo somehow what is going on, you know, in Hungary, like the AFD is sort of pushing now a huge debate in the middle of, of, of the table in Germany. And you have in Bavaria, we had uh, these very uh, difficult elections. And, and I think in Bavaria, the Bavarians are actually trying to sort of mend uh, bridges Does with, uh, with uh, Orban because they don't want, you know, the uh, populists to, to, F- to become too strong. Final word on this. Do you think Viktor Orban belongs in that voting bloc in the EPP? I don't think so, but I think the main question is the future of EPP because um, Macron is right in one point that uh, these big parties, the time is over. There are new divisions inside Europe and it's more between populists and progressists and uh, so these big parties are getting less and less important. All right, the end of the end of the, the end of the big blocks. So she's a former model and host of the Italian version of the hit TV show Ready Steady Cook. He's the deputy prime minister of Italy, and they 
are no longer an item. Elisa Isowardi <laughs> dumping Matteo Salvini on Instagram, posting, quote, it's not what we gave each other that I will miss, but what we still could have given each other with enormous respect for the true love that was. Thank you, Matteo. Salvini, who, by the way, is also interior minister, leader of the far-right league, caught off guard, it seems. He was on a trip to Ghana when this was all posted. He wrote, I loved, I forgave. Surely I also made mistakes, but I believed it all the way. Pity someone had other priorities. He also said, because of my thoughtfulness, my character, and respect for other people, and Elisabeth Moutet, I've never displayed my private life in public, nor will I start doing it now. Italians are not interested in it. <laughs> Yes, well, he was on the cover of Vanity Fair Italy uh, in that same bed, presumably wearing nothing but a sheet. <laughs> so in terms of displaying himself, I think that ship has sailed. Uh, it's, it's, I, mean, I think that is actually, uh, it's, it's, it's one bit of Matteo Salvini I find rather amusing and rather charming, to be quite honest, because, you know, he said, I will be depressed and then I'll, I'll soldier on and I, it's better to have loved. And that was quite lovely and quite charming and very unlike what he usually says. So I thought that was a nice relief from the general I think he could Salvini have, tone. I think he could have taken a lesson from President Sarkozy and Hollande and got another woman before that one dumped him. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's... Well, I rather like <laughs> Salvini better you, than the I, other I just two, looked it up to on that so, one. Just, just look it up, the Instagram account, which is really funny because he was following exactly one person so far. That was his girlfriend. Yeah. And since they separated, he's already following 40 persons. <laughs> so he's, he's, he's brought the field. What do you think of the choice of weapons here? She's on Instagram and he's on Facebook for all of this. <laughs> She's, he's sort of old fashioned, I would say. But <laughs> Facebook is more old fashioned, right? But I, I, what I think is, you know, this is really a sort of a manifestation of the peopleization of politics and also the, the, the sort of disappearance of any kind of uh, bo uh, borders between private life and public life. And anyone feels authorized, you know, to sort of suddenly, uh, you know, display on, on, on Facebook or on Instagram, you know, he, the private life. I think it's... It's in a way a bit unfortunate. Yeah. So this photo drawing a lot of attention, and and uh, and also Salvini's Facebook post. He says he's in Ghana, but of course behind him is a olive grove from Tuscany. Well, <laughs> but you know, probably... I, I think he's got a great future as a bachelor now. I mean, that, look at that photo. That's got to. He break says a lot he's not playing the field. <laughs> uh, I believe we're, that. We're going. We're going to leave the speculation there. Many thanks, and that he's a bit putte. Lamont Vie, George Cazoles, Ulrika Kolterman, stay with us, please. Media Watch is next. Um, and we say hello to Emma James. Hi there. Uh, one of the uh, most talked about stories. Um, it looks like we could all be out of a job soon. Is that what you're saying, effectively? <laughs> well, this is maybe, not a good news story. No, not for <laughs> us, uh, but not just yet. I don't okay. think we need to panic um, because although technology is a great ally to many journalists, it's also one of our biggest foes in many ways because everyone's become a citizen journalist. They've all got mobiles that they can film things on. Everyone can write a blog. Everyone can become a star on YouTube. Uh, the newspaper's struggling to stay uh, viable, really, in a digital age. Uh, now, courtesy of China, we have AI newsreaders, AI standing for artificial intelligence. Are they any good? Well, here's a clip. Take a look. Hello, everyone. I'm an English artificial intelligence anchor. This is my very first day in Xinhua News Agency. My voice and appearance are modeled on Zhang Zhao, a real anchor with Xinhua. I look forward to bringing you the brand new news experiences. I'm nervous. <laughs> <laughs> There's clearly still a little bit of work to do. I like the brand new news experiences. I'm looking forward to those ones. Um, I don't know if the Chinese version, because they've done an English and a Chinese one, I don't know if that's any better in terms mm. of its pronunciation. It's always the beginning, though. It is very much the beginning. Mm. Uh, yes, work in progress, which the people behind it admit themselves. It's been created by China's uh, Tsinghua news agency, State TV, if you like, um, and along with a, a search engine company by the name of Sogu. And they 
say it is a world first. Um, what are the benefits to it? Well, this tweet kind of sums it up quite nicely, this quote from one of the uh, people behind it. Each anchor can work 24 hours a day across various social media platforms, reducing news production costs and improving efficiency, even if we're not quite sure what they're talking about. Um, it doesn't seem to have had that great a reception looking around. The Huffington Post calling it deeply creepy, um, <laughs> saying that it's both impressively realistic and yet unsettlingly soulless. Right. Uh, and they also talk about the fact that coming from a country with such tight controls already on the media, this has a real distinctly dystopian feel about it. That's why um, we put the mistakes in on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> Keep telling yourself that. All right. <laughs> um, yes, lots of tweets about this one. The biggest benefit to its totalitarian masters is that it can be controlled fully. It will never go off script or display contradictory emotions. Fairly predictably, somebody had to say this. This is Trump's ideal world. Just get rid of the pesky humans with their independent minds altogether. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, we can't get away from him. Others asking, but can he do this? Because, of course, there's a lot it can't do. It has to have the words inputted by a real human being. <laughs> it can't react <laughs> to real-life situations like that one. You've got to bring up Roker. Okay. Absolutely. And somebody else pointing out that if a self-driving car can respond and even anticipate live events, it's only a matter of time. Cue ominous music. Um, as for the techie bods, The Verge have done a piece on this, and they say, basically, this is nothing more than a CGI puppet uh, spouting whatever's been prepared for them. Uh, but they do say that one day we are going to have AI presenters who are indistinguishable from the real thing. As Elisabeth Moutet would tell you, Iceland, it's not just a country, it's also a supermarket chain. It is a supermarket chain. You may not have heard of it if you're not familiar with uh, the UK. They've got about 900 stores, so they're pretty big. They specialise in frozen food in particular. Uh, and they are in trouble this year with their Christmas advert because it's been deemed too political. Uh, it is not allowed to be shown on British television. Uh, it's a very competitive thing, this, in the UK. Christmas adverts, everyone goes to make the biggest, the best, the most expensive, the most emotional. There's always those furniture stores. Yes, well, John Lewis last year spent £7 million making their advert. Right. Uh, but Iceland kind of did it the cheap way. They took a, a video that had been created by Greenpeace. Uh, take a look at this little excerpt. There are humans in my forest, and I don't know what to do. They're burning it for palm oil. So I thought I'd stay with you. The future's not yet written, but I'll make sure it is ours. Definitely trying to pull at the heartstrings with that one. Now, it was made by Greenpeace because, of course, orangutans now critically endangered because of deforestation, because of palm oil. Iceland have jumped into this argument because they're the first British major supermarket to say they are going to remove all palm oil from all of their products. Uh, they're very unhappy about the fact that this advert's been banned. Richard Walker is the managing director. He says, we are keen to keep raising awareness of rainforest destruction and customers can now choose a no palm oil Christmas and that seems to be catching on. Lots of people very angry about this. Uh, this is a disgrace, says Matt Haig, the uh, author. Saving the planet is not political unless living is political. No planet, no life. Uh, there's even a petition that's been gathering pace. Already thousands of people have signed it saying that this should be seen on British televisions. Uh, and other people reacting saying, well, Instead of banning Iceland's Christmas commercial for being too political, why don't we simply cancel Christmas for being too commercial? <laughs> he has a point. I think that's a pretty clever one. Um, some people are a little bit cynical about this, uh, asking, did they make it knowing it wouldn't be cleared for TV use? And so... Ah. It's all over social media. It's all anyone's talking about. Uh, and we've sh shown it here. But, hey, it's a very good cause. All right, including here, yes, on, on France 24. Many thanks uh, for that, Emma James. What's the name of the supermarket again? Iceland. Iceland, OK. Mum's gone to Iceland. I, That's I the want, slogan. I want to thank our panel once again. Thank you for joining us here in the world this week.